Coming up on First, some scenes from the Democratic National Convention, as chronicled through the eyes of some University of Delaware students. And what goes through the mind of artist Damon Pla? To get a better understanding of that, stay with us for First Experience. The home health care industry in the United States is projected to grow substantially over the next few years as the general population ages. A Middletown woman's personal experience with home health care services led her to start her own business in which she hopes she can offer better services than she received. They were very, very personable and because of that, it made it easier to transition from one company to the next company. And it um, lessened my fear about actually having to go be placed in a facility because I didn't want to be in a facility. Marcy Wilson Baines has been with Shore Care of Delaware for a year. Being able to maintain her independence was important to her. Shadasia comes in in the morning. She helps me with my ADLs, which is my acti normal activities. She helps me get uh, dressed. Um, I do a lot of it on my own. She basically sets things up for me. She's my legs. Wilson is like a lot of people who are opting to receive care at home. According to the Commission on Long-Term Care, the number of people needing help with their daily living activities will jump from 12 million to 27 million by 2050. It's a growing industry and um, the baby boomers are hitting the age where they're going to eventually need care. A baby boomer herself? Jackie Lesky first became interested in home health care when her mother took ill. Well, sure care actually was um, an inspiration of mine from years ago when my mother got sick. I was 12 years old and she was diagnosed with MS. Jackie and her father cared for her mother at their home. It was that experience that helped shape the core of her business. Consistency is a strong foundation that you need to give the family comfort as well as the person you're caring for. Jackie watched as different health care providers would show up and some, she says, were inappropriately dressed. You know, you need to make a family feel comfortable. I wanted to make sure that the girls know that, you know, we want to be professional, we want to be respected, you know, to wear your proper attire, which is our business attire, which is scrubs. Jackie makes a personal connection with every potential client before she and her staff assign a caregiver. I meet the family and I meet the person we're going to care for. And then I can get and draw from the feeling, like I know in my heart, like I know what they need. With a family-focused approach, it's not surprising that Jackie's husband, Ben, plays a role in the business. I do the day-to-day -day banking business stuff, uh, bill paying. You know, uh, like I said, we have a van. I, do the, I actually do the, the, the van transportation myself. The key for everyone at Shorecare, from its owner and president to its health care aides, is listening. We're not that big, you know, but I mean, still communication and making sure that you know, the customer is taken care of and we're tailoring to what they want or adjusting to what they need. And Marcy agrees. I'm a people person, and so I like people that's going to talk. I like it if I'm able to call the office. I want them to talk to me. I want them to know me, and I want to be able to know them so they know my needs as well as I know what they're offering to me. Earlier this year, the Small Business Administration recognized Jackie with the Woman Owned Business of the Year Award. If you want to tell a friend what you saw on FIRST, tell them to go to WHYY.org slash FIRST. All of our past shows are there, including the debates we've conducted in the Wilmington mayoral race. You can find it right now. Last week, the national political spotlight was on Philadelphia, where the Democrats came together for their convention. Right in the middle of all those people were three University of Delaware students. Two of them join us on our first person segment this week. Welcome Sarah Jo Lee and Andrew Wickman. Uh, first, tell me, tell us a little bit about what you guys did. So we were, got the opportunity to represent the University of Delaware and just go experience what all the other media people were experiencing. We got to go down on the floor. We got to interview senators. We got to interview the governor or governors, I should say, and, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. It was a great experience for college students like us. How were you selected, Sarah? 
Um, basically, I got an email from Professor Don Fallick uh, a couple months back, and she asked me if I'd be in the Philadelphia area in July. And I was like, yeah, why? What's up? And she told me about this and was like, we're trying to get it um, put together and trying to get a few students to go. Would you be interested? Like, Getting to do what we've learned in the classroom all four years of college and finally get to put it into use. I was like, yes, I would 100% be interested in that. Definitely an, an amazing uh, uh, experience. Uh, let's take a look at one of your videos. A delegate is someone who represents, uh, basically someone who represents the people. A delegate is somebody who has been elected to or appointed to serve a separate body as a representative to a larger body. A delegate is someone that goes out into um, as a representative for the uh, for the state. A delegate is an elected official. For the Democratic Party, pledged delegates are elected or chosen at the state or local level. For the state of Delaware, there are 32 total delegate votes, 11 still being unpledged. So, Andrew, the great thing about covering Delaware is that everyone seems to be accessible. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, I talked to Senator Coons twice and both times he was so welcoming to not only talking to someone from Delaware, but especially from the University of Delaware. He loved talking to students um, and especially on other, other times when we got to talk to delegates, they were so welcoming to all of us. They were, were very interested in having to hear what we had to say as well as then, them getting their word out to us. Well, Sarah, we didn't see you on the video, but tell us about your news gathering experience. So before the convention started, I got to speak with a bunch of delegates about how they fundraised to go there. So a lot of that was through email and calling them, and they were also so welcoming and so ready to talk to me. And then when I got there, we got to go to the Delaware Delegate Breakfast the first morning, and I got to put a name to the face. I'm like, oh, you're the girl who's been emailing me a lot. I'm like, yeah, that's me. And a lot of it was just going up to people at the protest and just saying, hey, can I have a few minutes to talk with you? Would you be interested? And everyone was just so willing to talk to us. It was great. Did you get to meet the vice president? Because he was at the breakfast, I hear. We did not. Okay. We went on Monday, but that would have been a great experience as I well. know. <laughs> so, Andrew, tell me, what went through your mind when you walked inside the Wells Fargo Center? Butterflies? Everything you could expect. Butterflies, stress, overwhelming excitement. It, it was... When, when I was driving down, I was super nervous because I didn't know what to expect. And then when I walked in the doors, adrenaline hit. And I was just like, this is, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm meant to do. And I just, I was ready. And it was a blast. Awesome. What about you? I remember, Andrew and I were texting right before we drove down on Sunday. We were like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I can't believe we're about to do this. And the same thing. We walked in. It was being able to put everything that we've learned and... I felt like I knew exactly what I was doing and I felt so prepared. So by the time we were doing the first interviews, it wasn't like I was a student anymore. I was a real journalist doing what everyone else was doing. Well, let's take a look at another video that you guys produced. Primarily, I'm going to be uh, looking at, there will be some stuff on Twitter. Um, I'll try to check the major mainstream news outlets, but uh, take notes with a grain of salt. And then uh, just kind of generally on Facebook periodically, there will be kind of those updates and that kind of thing. So I try to get a wide berth of information and then figure it out from there. So because I write about television, um, I am working with all of the different publicists of all of the different uh, stations and channels in order to... Uh, discuss what we're going to meet up, what we're going to talk about, things like that, and find the story behind the media in, at the DNC. So I get my news, um, I get like New York Times updates on my phone, Twitter, Facebook. I'm a big like social media kind of person, and so I always like to stay updated that way. There was definitely a lot of star power there. Any celebrities? Did you guys run into any? Yeah, we got a, on the first day we got a chance to walk by, not to meet anybody, but we got the chance to walk by Jerry Springer. Um, I got a chance to take a picture with him. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like a cool guy. We didn't get to talk to him, but he seemed like a pretty cool guy yeah. just walking around in the corner, yeah. And then what about, you? did you run into anyone else besides Jerry Springer? We saw Jerry Springer. We saw uh, Bachelor Chris Soles. Um, also didn't get to take a picture with him, but took a picture of him. Yeah. So that was exciting. And just meeting all the senators, too, that was great. And that was a good experience. Okay. Well, Sarah, you actually just graduated. Andrew, you're next. Uh, what are your plans? Uh, journalism, uh, do you plan to uh, take it on in the future? Definitely. And I will say this impacted my future plans quite a bit. Before, I wasn't too keen on the idea of covering politics. And after going through this and 
spending the week there, I realized there's a lot to politics that most people don't realize and how exciting it can actually be. Same for you. Same for me. I, I have a passion for sports broadcast, but being immersed in political broadcast just really opened my eyes to what it has to offer. And it's so, it's so much fun because there's a story happening every second and there's always something to cover and that's what I love. The, the adrenaline of doing something at, or something at every single moment of the day yeah. is really cool. That's so true. Sarah Jolie, Andrew Wickman of the University of Delaware, thanks for joining us here on FIRST. These UD students have written an article on their reflections at the convention and you can find it now when you go to newsworks.org slash Delaware. In our first experience this week, we head to Dagsboro and the studio of artist Damon Pla. A surrealist, Damon began his art career doing murals and landscapes. But Damon's real passion are his surreal paintings. Imagination, light, and a dose of Dolly all contribute to Damon's amazing art. My name is Damon Pla. Uh, I moved here to Delaware about 14 years ago from Florida. I actually uh, started with a lot of landscapes uh, because if there's anything that's cohesive in all my pieces is this late afternoon light. When you see that, any of us, on the road, wherever it might be, it sort of arrests you. You have to say, look at this lighting. You know, this lighting is sort of glowing the sky. I've got to stop and take a minute to look at it. Before I started painting landscapes, I actually was struck by Salvador Dali in my teen years in high school and loved to draw like that, but my landscapes and murals, I was able to learn my techniques and become comfortable with acrylic paint. So then I finally started to realize I can take what I used to do and start applying it to what I'm doing now with paint. My surreal works are more of my passion. They're more of an idea that it's just a moment. The way I would look at surrealism is it's so jumbled up that I don't cast judgment on it. I actually just take it in because I've got to figure it out in my head, like what's going on here? And I like that. I like that silent conversation. When you work in the paintings and they're just shapes, and you know, you're not getting anything. As soon as the sun is hitting, whatever scape it is, I am suddenly, I'm very happy, you know, because I think of it as not a sunset behind what it might be, but there's this great force behind what I'm seeing. So I hope that I capture that mood. That's what captivated me when I even first saw Surrealism was, it was a story that you didn't even have to read. You just sort of enjoyed it. And there was the mood of the story. And that's what I'm about. About 20% into the painting, it's for me. I am going. Suddenly, when the light hits and whatever's happening, I'm there. It doesn't matter who sees it, I'm happy. For me, it's almost as if my senses cross. Like that's what that painting sounds like, or that's what this painting feels like. So once you start to cross all your senses, that's when I know that it's really starting to arrest me. So I try to make it that people will see the same as I do. When I see the painting as I saw another artist's painting when I first discovered you know, surrealism when I was younger, and I have that same feeling when I see these. I know that whatever the piece is going to do, no matter if I start from the easel and it's a white piece of canvas, by the time I get to the end of it, I want it to stop people, whether it's at an art show, at a gallery, and just make them just completely pause. Like, hold on a second. I've got to figure this out. That moment of awe, you know, that we can take from anything, is what I hope that people will take from my work.
You can find Damon on August 6th and 7th at the Rehoboth Art League's Outdoor Show. But if you can't make it to Rehoboth, you can always visit Damon on the web at DamonPlaw.com. Next week on First, Delaware has cleared a path for convicted felons to keep their right to vote. We'll explore how that will work on the next first. And there are new ways to help those afflicted with hepatitis C. Alana Gordon from the WHYY Health and Science Desk has that story. Tuesday, we invite you to watch a special produced by our friends at Teleduction chronicling the rise of the Wilmington Riverfront. That airs at 5.30 on WHYY TV. That is first for this week. We thank you for watching. For Nichelle Polston and Shirley Min, I'm Mark Eichmann. Have a great week. In 2016, anybody can be a journalist with social media outlets. But at the Democratic National Convention, it's a little more important for delegates and reporters. We're here to find out how they report and receive their news. Uh, almost everything is digital. I mean, whether it's on my phone or at my, on my desktop, it is just the, the pace of what we do here. You're always sort of on the move, whether you're walking on the convention floor or going to uh, meetings with other party officials uptown in Center City. So you're always just sort of looking at your phone, seeing something that somebody tweeted, looking at an email because you've got 50 coworkers here who have seen something else that a competitor has said and emailed it around. So it is almost entirely digital. So I went, I did Facebook Live at one of the protests earlier a little bit, um, tweet occasionally, and then uh, generally speaking, try to synthesize thoughts into like a Facebook post, that kind of thing. My Snapchat presence is very strong, and so I've been sharing my experience at the convention via Snapchat. Um, but definitely when I get back and I have time to reflect on my experience, I'm going to share it in a more formal way, potentially like a blog, Facebook, etc. Reporting your, we have a team of anywhere from five to ten people every night who are just inside the hall, inside the Wells Fargo Center, just walking around, mingling with delegates, talking to delegates, and pulling out their phones and just zapping it in to this, the editors behind us here who will then take a cut paste, slap it into a into either a live blog or a rolling story that we call a lead all that is sort of the main story that will be on our website. Is it a representative with a cape? I honestly don't know what a superdelegate is. I kind of wonder. A superdelegate is a non-elected official that helps the delegate to uh, nominate. A superdelegate is a delegate to the Democratic National Convention who is seated automatically. These people include distinguished party leaders and elected officials. This would include Vice President Joe Biden and Governor Markell.